Welcome everybody to the eighth webinar within the Mind Philosophy series. My name is Patrick Renthoop. I'm the events manager at the Mind Foundation. And today it is my pleasure to have Dr. Anna Schiaunica with me. Um, just as a quick reminder, what, what do we want to do with this philosophy series? We want to both give people who are interested in philosophy um, some insights into why psychedelics and order states of consciousness in general are interested, interesting for philosophers. And also the other way around. So if you're pretty interested in psychedelic research, but uh, did not have um, a lot of connections or are not that familiar with um, philosophical topics yet, then this is also an opportunity for you to make yourself familiar and, and learn more. So that's what we intend to do here. And um, we will have around about 45 minutes of presentation by Dr. Anna Schionica. And afterwards, you can also ask questions. There's no, no wrong or stupid questions. So please feel free to um, ask whatever you want. Yeah, and a few words about you, um, Anna. So you've been with us um, at Mind Events for quite some time. You've been at Insight Symposium and the conference, and we're always very happy to have you. Uh, you are a philosopher and cognitive scientist. And as we were speaking, currently you're very busy, even busier than, than normal. So you're involved in many projects. I'm not really sure what kind of projects I, I should mention, but I would just mention a few. So, for example, you're a principal investigator at the Center of Philosophy of Science um, in, at the University of Lisbon in Portugal. Um, that's already uh, maybe a full time job, I'm not sure. But then you're also the uh, co PI. Um, of a project looking at the um, relationship between dreams, sense of self, and self-detachment, um, together with Professor Helge Schillmeister. And furthermore, you are coordinating the Network for Embodied Consciousness and Arts. And um, you've also been uh, the perfect match back then, two years ago, at the Inter Symposium, where we also made a pretty good connection between arts and consciousness. Um, so with that platform, you bring together artists, scientists, researchers, stakeholders um, yeah, to shine light on the, the connection between arts and, and consciousness. And tonight, your talk is called The Extraordinary Self, Leaving the Ordinary Sense of Self Behind. So, of course, now we're curious about what's the extraordinary and the ordinary sense is. So I give it over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patrick, for this very kind introduction. Uh, can you hear me okay? Okay. Uh, yeah, it's it's always a pleasure to be here, both physically in Berlin, but also virtually in the community. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen. I think this one. Can we see it right now? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, good. Um, so thank you so much for the invitation. And uh, as you said, my research is highly interdisciplinary. Um, since it's like evening <laughs> in Europe, I'm going to try to keep it um, engaging, uh, but also I'm going to try to keep it like um, accessible to people with different backgrounds from different disciplines. Um, I also want to say that some of the slides, I don't know if you already saw a couple of my talks before, but some of the slides are uh, already there for a while now. Uh, but I'm going to assume that you don't know anything about me and about my research. And I apologize in advance for those of you that already saw the slides like many times. <laughs> but as the basis, I mean, the basis really doesn't change. Yeah. So um, I'm going to start with a couple of very short slide of introduction about my background if i see this thing okay so um so i did my phd thesis in france in burgundy uh as in philosophy of mind and i worked on uh, physicalism in qualia so namely how you know physical properties in brain relate to mental properties of experiences for instance like i mean typically People get the example of what this is like to see a red tomato. It's like the famous knowledge argument of Frank Jackson, Mary, the famous scientist. But um, I like to 
uh, get the example of drinking wine because while I was based in Burgundy, I said, well, what is it like to actually drink a white Burgundy versus a, you know, um, red Burgundy? Uh, but uh, the, and also because I was interested more in the proximal senses, and as you'll see later, you all understand better why uh, senses like taste, olfaction, and touch. Um, yeah, so that's that's my uh, thesis, and then. Um, while I was doing my first postdoc, uh, postdoc in Switzerland, I decided to jump off the theory armchair in philosophy and actually do also some um, experimental work. So I did a master in cognitive science, uh, Lyon, and I was looking more at how um, this experience developed rather than how we perceive them in the here and now. So I was interested more in dynamical approach of how subjective experiences actually um, get off the ground from square one, so to speak. Um, and then I moved with a project I looked, um, it's a sort of like interdisciplinary project looking at uh, the sense of self and embodiment uh, in collaboration with a, um, a neuroscientist based in, um, in London. So that was a project between Porto in Portugal and um, UCL in London. Um, so I spent a couple of time in London uh, at ICN and I was a, a, a sort of like philosophy residence there. And um, my, um, my job there was to ask annoying question to scientists. What do you mean by perception? What do you mean by social? What do you mean by interaction? Yeah. Um, and one of my favorite questions was uh, to ask people around in the audience while they were listening to my talks, why there are no, you know, babies around to actually take notes and you know listen to my science and people were like what do you mean <laughs> and and some other was saying well I told you we shouldn't have a philosophy in the room they ask the silly questions it's like yeah uh but actually it's not I I think it's not trivial at all to ask this question because what I really want to get to is the fact that when we study when we start to study certain phenomena for instance like experiences, subjective experiences or consciousness or the mind or perception, we already take, endorse the perspective of an adult, yeah? So this means that maybe the lens that we're using to investigate this phenomena is also somehow bias our, our investigation. So what I really want in my work as a philosopher, but also cognitive scientist, is actually to try to get rid of those biases as much as possible and to look at how things unfold dynamically, not how they are fully fledged um, in, um, in an adult um, perspective. And why is this important? So you're probably, I, I give this example many, many, many times by now, but let's assume that you want to create a minimal model of this system, right? Or this system, yeah? And if you take the fully fledged structure, so to speak, of the system, then you might be very tempted to actually just squeeze the properties of the system that you find at this stage and, you know, put in a smaller thing. And then uh, the same with, uh, let's say, the human mind. And that would be uh, a mistake because if you look at how things basically unfold ecologically, you can see that in order to get at this stage, you need to start with this one and this, this structure form and the property of the system here may not be the same of the property of the system here. And in order to understand this system, adult sense, you need to basically develop, um, um, examine the development of the system at any faults, yeah? Not just at like this like final stage. And it's similar with um, the human um, uh, perception as well. So that's, that's, if you like, this is the main insight I would like to almost all the time um, permeate my um, research because it's really important to just like to step back and look at um, phenomena from a dynamic ecological uh, developmental perspective. Uh, and in doing so, I'm taking what um, some people uh, call the biogenic approach to cognition. And I'm a um, big fan of uh, Pamela Lyons' work on this. And she basically contrasts the anthropogenic approach with the biogenic approach to cognition and um, 
Um, and she says, for instance, like um, the anthropogenic approach assumes human cognition as a paradigm and work down to a more general co explanatory concept. Uh, whereas like the biogenic approach focuses on the things that not distinguish the human perception, cognition, action from other systems, biological system, but basically what reunites us, what actually makes us links <laughs> the human cognition with the, uh, you know, other um, type, type of forms of perception, action, and cognition in the other biological systems. So this means that we need to focus on the things that relate us, connect us to the other systems rather than to those that distinguish us from the other systems, biological system. Uh, so we start with facts of biology as the basis for theorizing and works up to the human case by asking psychological question as if there are biological question. I think this is an important point because, you know, if you take the mind-body problem, a kind of like fascinating philosophy for centuries, so if you take the biogenic approach, instead of looking at the body as being like some sort of like vehicle uh, designed to, or support system designed to fuel, transport the mind. Um, if you take a biological perspective is that way around, you can see that actually the mind has evolved to subserve the needs of a biological system, which is the body. Yeah, it's that way around. So the body comes first. But typically in philosophy, um, so people define, you know, the self, self-awareness and uh, self-consciousness uh, through uh, this distinction between the subject and the object of a perception. And I'm taking this example because uh, this example shows very well how this tacit adult-centric perspective may permeate the way we understand basic concepts such as, for instance, like self-awareness. So for instance, typically self-awareness is defined as the ability you know, to you know, recognize yourself on the mirror. So you have a perceived subject here and a perceived object there. Uh, and this is more like a, a, a visual distal type of like um, uh, perception, right? So I can see myself uh, from um, other people's eyes, right? Um, and there are different traditions here that distinguish between the self as a subject of an experience and the self as an object of an experience. And, um, and for instance, like uh, Wittgenstein was like famously distinguishing between the I as a subject and I as an object of an experience. And a famous example here that he gives is like, I, um, I can say something like, suppose I'm saying something like I'm falling or I'm in pain. Um, I may be wrong about the fact of the content of that experience. Let's say that I'm not falling, but actually I have the dream of the hallucination that I'm falling, but actually I'm you know, laying down safely in my bed. So in this case, I may be wrong with the content of experience, but I cannot be wrong with the fact that I'm having that experience, yeah? So the subject here is intrinsically linked to the experience of like, you know, falling. But if I look at myself in a mirror, let's say, and, um, or in a picture, on a photograph, on a selfie, I'm saying, oh, I look awesome in the selfie, then I might be wrong about the I, the attribution of that I in that selfie, because let's say it's not me, but my twin sister, yeah? So I can be wrong with that I. So I see myself through um, a detached perspective. So that's a very typical way of defining, for instance, like self-awareness. Um, and we can distinguish between reflective self-consciousness, which, as I said, it involves the subject-object relation between two different mental states, the reflecting and the reflected. Uh, and pre-reflective self-consciousness, that's something that phenologists argue for centuries, saying that self is something that's intrinsically present and subject in each, in each and every experience. And the reason, I mean, this distinction is important because typically um, in, in the literature, especially in psychology, for instance, like um, one will uh, define uh, self-consciousness as the ability to recognize yourself for instance, in the mirror, and they'll say that before you're having the ability to know that actually that's you in the mirror, you're not necessarily uh, self-conscious. Uh, so that's one, one possible take on, on the matter. What I want to say here is that, for instance, like we may have a case here where because we take another centric perspective of what is 
is to actually experience and perceive the world, maybe that definition actually is not um, the best, the optimal definition we can get. Uh, and why is that? Is because, as I said, we may be tested in those uh, visual and distal um, perspective on how we see ourselves literally. <laughs> So what I really want to ask in my research is like, how do we really get in contact with the world at most primitive and fundamental stages? Uh, and I did some work showing that basically well before we perceive ourselves from a distal, visual, spatial, distal, uh, distal perspective, for instance, like ability to recognize yourself in a mirror, we spend actually way more time by in close contact with ourselves and others but literally because our first experiences and perception about our bodies and the world arise already when we share our body with the body of another person, namely our mothers. So um, this is not a line of work I'm going to insist here, but I think it's important because you'll see later why, because it's, re it's related to how we sense the world and how we relate to the world through the senses at the very first stages of our lives and later on why why is this uh, important um, and the reason why I'm insisting on this in my research in general is because when we when we talk about pregnancy uh, typically people seem to um, you know connect pregnancy with a certain category of person that have the ability to carry babies in their own bodies but if you look through the perspective of developing human we all have shared whole body with the body of another person. So that experience is universal. And I want to say that those experiences are highly multisensory and proximal in nature. Uh, so this means, um, so there is a lot of study that show, for instance, like that um, in womb and in early life, uh, proximal senses such as like touch and uh, um, smell and, and taste, they, are developed, they have a high prevalence in uh, perception of the world and perception of our own body. So um, for instance, like fetuses spend an incredible amount of time touching themselves um, in, um, in a womb. And also we need those proximal interaction with the others in early life to actually develop a healthy sense of self and um, boundaries and one and, and the others. And the reason why I'm saying this is because, and this is why I'm getting to the extraordinary self. Finally, I did it all this detour because I think it's important to have like the background um, there is because I want to argue that perhaps the most important things are those we can, can't see and take for granted. <laughs> Um, and I take here the, the, the tree metaphor. So suppose that, you know, you want to understand how a tree functions. If you look only at the visible branches, like what you see above the ground, you're not going to miss something important about, you know, how the tree functions in the first place, because, well, you cannot have this without the roots, right? So I want to see that if you really want to understand how human self-consciousness and conscious experience work, <laughs> Uh, we really need to take a development perspective because we need to look at the roots of our experiences in order to understand how experiences unfold and what is so special about them. Yeah, And I want to say that some of our senses through which we perceive the world are somehow invisible in the sense like we don't pay attention to them uh, because they are, they are pervasive all the time, but they are really important for our sense of self and how we connect with, uh, with the world. Uh, and I think one of the most famous metaphors that has been developed in the literature is the uh, transparent window metaphor, right? So suppose you have this like landscape and you have the feeling that, you know, you look through a window and the window is so clear and so clean that you have the feeling that you, you are there, you know, it's, you are immersed already in the, in the landscape. But then you realize that actually, you know, there is a window there. And that allows you to um, access the landscape. And I think the, the, the nicest way to see that there is a window there um, is when there is a crack in the window. Yeah. So for instance, like if you have, you, you cannot see that there is something there, which I would like to call them this kind of like transparent self. You cannot see this there because 
it's always there. <laughs> but now suppose there's a crack in the self, right? In this kind of like sense of self, then um, you, you, there are two things that immediately pop out, so to speak. The first is that uh, you realize that there was something there when you consider there was nothing there. And second, there's like your immersiveness in the world is somehow shattered. You cannot see so clearly what connects, you know, with, with the external world. So I think that's, that's, that's super important. And why I'm saying all this, because this is how it's connected with this idea of like ordinary versus extraordinary sense of self. So here's the question that I asked myself lately with one of my colleagues and collaborators, Adam Saffron. So if, you know, humans, like any other biological creatures, are somehow, you know, um, driven by this, like, ability, the desire to survive and eventually reproduce. And if in, in order to achieve that, you need to somehow achieve a, some sort of like predictable world and environment, yeah, you know, to make sure that you reduce levels of uncertainty to connect with, you know, the world in a safe way and to make sure that actually you survive. Uh, so this means that you need to achieve an, an, a stable and a, a balanced way to, to, to know yourself and to connect yourself with the environment, yeah. Uh, so let's call this, let's say, the familiar or the ordinary sense of self. So for instance, if you wake up in the morning, you expect your hands to be a certain size, you accept, accept, uh, expect your room to be a certain color, and, um, you know, people to speak a certain language. So we you are somehow surrounded by a, environment which is like very highly familiar to yourself. Now, a question that we asked with Adam in one of those recent papers is, it seems that the humans, this, they have this fabulous capacity to try to get rid of this like familiar sense of self, right? To leave it behind, right? Um, and to try extraordinary ways, so non-ordinary non ways to actually connect with the self and the environment. Yeah, and to escape the familiar sense of self and the presence in the world. Uh, and this is across times and cultures, humans like systematically try to, you know, experience different things and to play a bit with the familiarity and ordinary sense of self. And for us, it was like, this, this, this is, it looks like an interesting um, research question. And because, well, First of all, I think novelty seeking and curiosity based behavior might provide a significant evolutionary advantage over rigid and limited, limited ones. Uh, because, well, no matter how familiar you are with what is happening in your environment, you know, the, the world is bigger than our heads. So this means that there are always going to be something uncertain out there in the world. So being creative and curious, curious about it it's a good, maybe a good evolutionary advantage, but one shouldn't be too curious, you know, too much because you know the, what people say is like curiosity killed the cat. So what is the, how you can strike the balance between, you know, what is safe, you know, you need some sort of stability and, but also some sort of openness, yeah. Uh, so the idea is if it's true that we really need to survive and reproduce. And for that, we need to keep our body states within a certain range for survival. Why do you, do we as humans try to also step outside this like familiar boundaries? Why it's so special about it? Yeah. Um, so there are so-called altered or non-ordinary states of consciousness which involve dramatic changes in the sensory, time, and space perception, which leads to novel perspective on uh, familiar phenomena. Uh, and as I said, there are like many, many ways to actually achieve this type of extraordinary uh, state of perception and experiences. Um, some people use intense contemplative practices, for instance, like um, to leave behind the daily selves, like um, meditation and mindfulness. Uh, some other use uh, intense bodily movement or dance technique, like trance or creative activities. So for instance, like you want to become an actor or writer, you 
you need to leave behind your ordinary sense of self and to become literally those different characters, right? Uh, others attempt to use various chemical substances like uh, that you find in nature or not in nature to achieve modification of experience re uh, reality for recreational, personal, spiritual, and sometimes professional purposes. Uh, more recently, people use also virtual reality as a powerful tool to achieve this transformative goal to basically you know, leave behind what we ordinarily perceive, the ordinary lens through which we perceive ourselves and the world, and to try to drastically modify the perception of the body and the surrounding. Um, and here is a quote that I really like. Some of you maybe read French, but the translation means that the poet, or let's say the creative person, um, starts seeing by a long, tremendous, and systematic um, derreglement. I don't know how to translate this, like um, unbalancing, unbalancing of all the senses, right? So there is a way in which the poet here, Rambo is saying, is like, okay, so if you really want to see something, <laughs> um, something extraordinary, uh, it comes through um, a sort of imbalance of the senses, yeah, which is, and this is really important. This is why I spent so much time at the beginning of my talk talking about like why it's important to go back to the, to the basic sensorial experience that we have of the world. Um, and I like this metaphor here because if you remember the cracked window metaphor, right? Um, so I think I think here what what Rambo is trying to say is say okay. So if you really want to see things that you don't really see usually, sometimes some cracks in the windows need to be induced, right? And I think this is precisely what is happening in all these transformative experiences that I listed in the previous slide. So people try to induce this type of like cracks in the window, first of all, because they want to somehow see <laughs> themselves in a relation to that. Because if, if let's say that's the, the, that window is the sense of self, then it basically can put the finger on, you know, your self, uh, but also in relation to, to, to the world, right? Um, so it, there is a way in which you can somehow almost systematically and have a sort of like approach to oneself in relation to the world by controlling and um, uh, trying to induce uh, this like out of the ordinary cracks in one's uh, sense of self and perception in, in the world through, uh, through the senses, yeah? Um, so based on a very simple idea uh, with Adam in this paper, we basically used the um, influential um, active inference framework to address the question of uh, flexible and inflexible self and world models in human embodiment. So the idea would be that if we go back to the window metaphor, to the transparency metaphor, then what, the, what is really adaptive for humans is how to flexibly modulate the perspective that one can take through that window, right? Uh, to use that window as, as a sort of like mean to um, know better oneself and better oneself in relation to oneself, one's body and, and the world. But the key idea here is that one has to be flexible enough to make sure that actually we can switch back and forth between different perspective. Otherwise, one can get stuck in something which is, um, can, be, can be dangerous, yeah? Um, so as I said, it's like one, one idea that I'm developing recently with um, some of my projects, but um, also in this paper, is that yes, the body is important, but not just the body. <laughs> because the body basically moves all the time. And when I'm saying this, I'm actually very careful when I'm saying, because sometimes people say, actually, in, in Amsterdam at the AACC conference, Association for the Scientific Study of Consciousness conference. So I, I brought up this idea of like bodily movement and relationship to the consciousness. And somebody said to me, oh, but I can watch Netflix uh, 
and not moving and I still being conscious. Um, and, and my reply to that was, well, well, I, maybe we're actually confusing body movements with body actions because, well, me, for, even if I'm staying still, I don't have the intention to move whatsoever. My body still moves without me, so to speak, intending because, well, I need to breathe. I need to, you know, my heart beats and I'm blinking. So the body moves all the time. And the idea behind this is that body and movement go together. Um, all the time. So this means that we may have built in our sense of self for some sort of like transparent movement body, moving body, yeah, which is there all the time. So this means that without us being even realizing our basis, the basis of the sense of self is not just body, but it's basically a dynamic body and it's a flexible body. It's a body that takes different perspectives. And I think this is somehow, as I said, compatible with this um, the influential predictive processing view. I'm not going to go into details here, but the basic idea here is that we don't perceive the world as it is, but we perceive the world as we expect to be based on our prior experiences. So we need to perceive the world, we basically perceive the world through the flow of our, you know, our prior experiences. Um, and not in a uh, static fashion. Uh, and the way we do this uh, in order to keep track of the survival and reproduction relevant bodily and worldly information, the human brain generates self and world models by extracting statistical patterns of information from its embodied and worldly interaction. So the idea here is because the information coming in is obviously higher and bigger than you know, our computing processing in the head, the way we deal with this is we somehow build, build a, a model um, and then we contrast the model. Our brains anticipate the, the next sensory input on the basis of prior sensory input. Um, and if there is a mismatch, well, we have a prediction error and that's sent back to the system and updates the, the model flexibly. But the idea here. I'm not going to enter into the technical details because I'm not a mathematician, but I think the idea here for me as a philosopher is that, well, everything is on the move. Yeah. So we basically need to all the time adapt and update and flexibly change our perception and our models in order to fit with a constantly moving world and also constantly moving body. Yeah. Um, because we feel that we are the same old or familiar self, but our body is never exactly the same as it was one second ago. Literally everything around us, in, even in our body, moves as we speak. We take in oxygen uh, all the time. So we are constantly changing, exchanging information with the environment. There is no way in which our body is some solid rock self or ourselves, solid rock selves that not change. So we need to change all the time. So if that's the case, that's main, basically what we really need to look into more carefully is like how that change is happening and why it's so important to actually become and stay flexible. Yeah. Uh, so for instance, like uh, Seth and colleagues have described insensitivity to such alteration as a kind of like change blindness that may be an essential component of the phenology of selfhood or being you, right? However, while so, such self-course grading could be understood as a source of necessary stability for selfhood, it may also result in a situation which individuals may find themselves stuck in modes of being with inflexible, maladaptive cell processes as for instance, observed um, observe in the personalization. Um, and I cite here the personalization because it's, it's one of my main um, research topics, but can be the case with uh, many other uh, conditions. Uh, depersonalization is a condition which people feel detached from their own self and their own bodies, and they feel very much stuck in, this, in the head and outside the body. Um, but the key idea here is that somehow, our brains needs to strike the balance between, you know, keeping track of what is relevant to the self with a sufficiently stable self model, 
while at the same time make it flexible enough to you know be ready to engage with the world which is by definition unpredictable uh, and that in the world i also include the what is coming from the body the information is coming from the from the body as well because you know we saw it with covid you know us like um uh, if if the virus is gets in, gets um, in, into we breathe in the you know the virus, so this means that we may have some uh, dangers coming literally from uh, inside our body, not necessarily from the outside. For instance, I get hit by a truck. Yeah, so we need to have we need to be to strike the balance between stable enough models of the self, but also flexible enough to um, you know deal with a constantly moving environment so and one of as I, as I listed in one of the previous slide one of one of the ways to actually deal with this type of like instability or uncertainty is to basically crack a bit the window yeah uh, and to change a bit transform a bit the way through which the way we perceive ourselves and the environment and some people, Argue that one way to do it is obviously with via psychedelic mechanism. Yeah. Um, so such experiences, um, you know, provoked by um, uh, psychedelics uh, mechanism, involve a stance with radically altered uh, prior expectations, providing opportunity for more flexible, which modulates self and world models. So basically, you train the system that the system that, I mean, you train the system to learn that the model that is typically used can be changed yeah, in a controlled fashion. So this type of enhanced flexibility may be primary mediator for positive outcome associated with psychedelic psychotherapy, for example. Um, this is because the induction of the control deviation from the normal or default mode of operation may alter the typical multisensory integration of bodily signals underlying the ordinary self and world experiences. And such embodied processes may constitute the core or the roots of the generative model that control or constitute the individuals, which when altered may lead in turn to the subjective phenomenology of losing familiar ways of perceiving oneself and the world. And we want to say in this paper with Adam that actually when people talk about losing the self, <laughs> it's a misleading way of talking because what people lose is basically one typical way of um, you know, perceiving oneself, but they gain a new way, right? Um, and even the very experience of losing oneself is an experience given to a self, namely myself, yeah? So the idea here is that the carefully controlled deviation from the normal default or the typical, if you prefer, biophysical functioning may enhance the flexibility of multiple levels ranging from psychological processes to neural dynamics, potentially turning body, brain, mind towards a regime that is more conducive to playful exploration and open-ended evolution. And the fact that these changes are intentional, this means that the sense of agency is intact, may further contribute to the feeling of widening the horizon of one's experience and ensuing well-being. And in this paper, I, I'm, I'm not talking about this today here for the sake of time, but in our paper, we basically contrast this experience of like losing oneself through psychedelics and in the personalization. And basically the, 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 main, the main contrast is the fact that in one case is we still have control over something. For instance, I can choose to take the psychedelics and go through that um, transformative experiences, I, I scarcely choose to actually experience a trauma. So on accident, for instance, right? So there's something like it's simply happening to me. So I don't have control over that event. So even if I do have like some sort of like transformative experience, in one case, I do have the control. In another case, I don't have the control that might completely change the balance of my um, experience. Importantly, higher flexibility of self and role models may enhance novel seeking, curiosity-driven exploratory behavior, which in turn gradually expand personal comfort zone and well-being. However, as we say, 
These changes need to be carefully modulated and controlled by an agent. This means the experiencer, the person experiencing in charge, there is someone in command there, namely myself. I think that's super important. And I'm going to end with this, um, with an example, uh, talking about the transformative, the extraordinary son's self-experiences. Uh, I don't know if you are familiar with this novel by um, Sir Husset. It's called The Blazing World. And why is this, why, don't, why I'm bringing this novel here and this example, for those of you already read it, maybe you know already, but this novel is fantastic for uh, the purpose, for the points I want to make here, because it is written in such a way that each chapter basically narrates the same event seen through the um, perspective of a different character. So there is an event happening, and then uh, the same event is described by the participants at that event through different lenses, yeah, through different characters, okay? This is best per se is, is simply fabulous work because to be able to actually, you know, step into the shoes of so many different people, characters, and to see the world through so many different lenses is, is simply fascinating, yeah? So how flexible can one be to actually take this perspective? And I had the chance, the, the, the fabulous chance to actually um, have a conversation with Siri about this novel last year um, at the workshop organized by Vittorio Galese on the importance of like proximal senses, like touch, for instance. And I, I because I was I was fascinated by the ability to actually take so many perspectives without losing oneself, right? <laughs> How can you basically write so many different perspectives but still know who you are? And I I, I asked Siri precisely this question. So how can you transform yourself? How can you leave yourself behind and to become this, all these different people without losing track of yourself? So I asked the question to Siri and the, 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 the answer, her answer was like fabulous. Um, and she said, well, actually is that way around. I have the feeling that the more, the more perspective I take, which are different from myself, the better I can find my way back to my real self, so to speak. Yeah. So the baseline self, so to speak. So, and I think this is a very nice example of why it's important to actually be able to flexibly endorse different perspectives through different techniques, uh, such as actually keep track better <laughs> of precisely where you are, because the self is always developed in relation to others, you know, um, other people and, and the world. Um, and with this, I would like to conclude. I would like to, first of all, to say that this is work that we are doing. So now what I presented here is um, theoretical work, but right now, as we speak, we are also collecting data on, you know, alteration of self um, experiences through bodily movements. Uh, so I have this fabulous team here, and this work is generally funded by uh, Templeton Foundation uh, via the uh, SNAP event. Uh, and with this, I would like also to thank uh, Adam Safran because he's my main co-author on the paper and uh, we developed these ideas together. And finally, I would like to thank you all for your attention and I look forward to your questions. And yeah, I'm very open to collaboration. So don't hesitate to get in touch with me and yeah, um, come to Lisbon. Thank you. It was a pleasure to have you, Dr. Anna Thank you, <laughs> Thank you so much for your precious time. And we hope that you will join us again for one of the next conferences, next events. And to all participants, we hope that you also join us again in one of the next uh, events. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. And I, I really hope that one day we'll be able to do some sort of like joint event between Berlin and Lisbon. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah that would be nice. Yeah. Definitely. Let's do that. Awesome. Okay. Everybody okay. enjoy the evening. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.